Good evening, everyone. My name is Douglas Sprang, and I lead the Energy and Environment Series for the MIT Club of Northern California. Tonight's event is the fifth in a series of all virtual events during our 2021 season, featuring top speakers in the field, with tonight's guest being David Keith, who will present the case for ge solar geoengineering. Because of my great interest in this subject, I'll also be the moderator for this evening. I have a deep concern that even with a major change in our current course and speed, we are going to devastate this beautiful planet and the life on it if we do not take some bold action beyond what is currently being contemplated. David's gonna tell us about one such possibility. In spite of the large audience tonight where you have enabled chat, but would request that you please just introduce yourself and where you're from if you wanna do that, but don't carry on a dialogue during the proceedings. Also, uh, we're going to enable live Q&A, and I'll do my best to get as many of these questions in as possible at the end of the session after the presentation, although past experience does suggest that we don't get to all of them. We will also answer many of the questions that we receive through online registration. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker. David wears two hats at Harvard University. He is both a professor of applied physics in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, as well as a professor of public policy at the Kennedy School. He realizes that science and technology alone don't constitute a solution, and that policy is key to getting things done on a large, especially a global scale. While at Harvard, David has led the development of Harvard's Solar Geoengineering Research Program, a university-wide research initiative. But he's much more than a leading academic. He's also the founder and chief scientist of Carbon Engineering, a Canadian company developing technology to capture CO2 from ambient air and to make carbon neutral hydro hydrocarbon fuels out of it. He has worked on solar geoengineering since 1992 when he wrote a paper on the technology and its policy implications, which introduced a structured comparison of cost and risk. Later, he followed up with a paper describing the moral hazard of the technology. He's been out there in important forums ever since his early work. He testified before committees of Congress and the UK Parliament. He's presented to the US National Academy on three separate occasions. He's the co-author uh, he is co-author of the geoengineering subchapter of the third IPCC report. He's been featured on Discovery Channel, interviewed by BBC News, participated in TED Talks and debated at the Royal Geographical Society. He's won several prestigious awards, first prize in Canada's National Physics Prize exam. He's received MIT's prize for ex excellent in experimental physics and he was Time Magazine's Hero of the Environment in 2009. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome David Keith to our virtual podium. David, welcome. Thank you. And Great to be here, thank you very much. You're welcome. And before you begin your presentation, I'd just like to ask you a few questions, okay? There's not a lot of information on your early life, but you seem to have a strong tie to Canada I know you moved there when you were only two years old, but where did you settle and what was life like back then? Uh, I, I grew up in Ottawa, Canada. I was born in Madison, but grew up in Ottawa, Canada. And um, I don't know, maybe a relevant thing is that my uh, father and stepmother did environmental work. So I kind of grew up in a family that did environmental work early on. My uh, dad had a role in understanding the early DDT science and I, even distantly in the lawsuit that created environmental defense. So I saw people, you know, I saw people at work doing that and both did practical field work. So I was out uh, in a herring gull colony, for example. So a range of things. And I got interested in the outdoors early. Great. And you know, this is primarily an MIT audience. And we may be wondering, how did you get into MIT from a modest upbringing in Canada? And was there a special someone along the way to mentor you? Yeah, one lucky break. I, 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 um, I was dyslexic. I was slow to learn to read and write. Um, I had a, a pretty mixed record in undergrad. I think I dropped out at the beginning of third year. And uh, so it wasn't at all obvious that I would be able to get into MIT for grad school. I'd say the big break for me was um, uh, I ended up just getting introduced as a tour that he later confessed to me he was pissed off he had to give to some high school students, a guy called Paul Corkum at the National Research Council of Canada, 
I guess I asked good questions on the tour and he ended up hiring me and I worked for him three summers, the first last summers of high school and the first summer of undergrad. And I couldn't have worked in, walked into a better physics lab. Uh, Paul is a, a, a incredible, uh, one of the sort of absolute leaders of short pulse laser physics and papers on the cover of Science and Nature could easily have won a Nobel Prize, really amazing guy and also a very down to earth practical guy. And he wasn't really famous then. So I had a lot of time with him and I had a lot of time in a huge laser lab and it was just terrific learning machine shop, electronics, the whole thing. So I'd say that was really pivotal uh, uh, for me, that, that mentorship. That's a great story. So you received your PhD in physics at MIT and then you followed that up with a postdoctorate in atmospheric chemistry at Harvard. Now these are usually odd bedfellows, but did you already have a plan in mind to address climate change when you selected these fields of study? No, certainly when I, when I, uh, uh, I actually um, have a tie to the high Arctic and I was, um, had, after grad school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I took a year off. I thought I wanted to be an alpine guide and I was climbing a lot and I ended up taking a job in the high Arctic so I could get there. And so I actually found out I got it to MIT over the shortwave radio call out between the uh, field stations in the high Arctic. And, um, uh, and I, I wrote in my diary at the time that I, I mean, I love physics, but it wasn't clear I wanted to do that for good. It was sort of, to me, a bit of a union card and like figuring out what I want to do next. So I, I went in, I was Dave Pritchard's student, which was like one of the best groups you could be in. I think in, in, in physics, it was terrific. But I think I went in maybe looking for something else, not thinking I necessarily wanted to keep doing physics. And I met through friends people at MIT. And actually, there's a very interesting bottom up thing I tell students a lot, that there have been students, uh, grad students between Harvard and MIT collaborating um, on, on what we call global change science and policy. So a range of people from MIT atmospheric science and more Harvard policy on, on climate change. This would be in about 88 or so. I met some of these people as, as friends. And, uh, and I just kind of found that was a really interesting problem because it matters to the world, obviously. And uh, there were also like sort of zero order scientific uncertainties, you know, really big uncertainties. I first worked on the question of how much heat is transported from the pole to the equator. And it turns out that like, that's uncertain by like, or was by 30%. And that's pretty exciting because in physics, there aren't so many big uncertainties left and, and not such so many things that kind of matter for, for day to day. So that's kind of what pulled me out. And I would say by the last year of grad school in physics, I was totally happy to write my PhD in my papers. It wasn't like I didn't like it, but I was already starting to read atmospheric science and really think about that. And that was kind of clear that's where I was going. So I didn't even look for a postdoc in physics. So that's really when you made up your mind that you were gonna really focus on climate change as your life's work. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, nobody ever plans their life, but that's really when I, that's where I headed, yeah. Yeah, that's neat. Well, now in 2013, you wrote a book called A Case for Climate Engineering. Um, I think we're gonna see it here, yeah. Uh, it outlines what some believe to be a controversial strategy for slowing global warming. Why did you write this book some 20 years after you began your work in solo geoengineering? And do you consider it controversial? Well, I didn't know it's just objectively true that it's controversial. There are um, really thoughtful people who think this idea is just terrible and shouldn't be talked about. I mean, just to, just to like give a name, there's a guy, may actually be an MIT, I don't remember who he is, Ray Pierre Humbert, who I had dinner with and love as a friend and is one of the best earth scientists around. He's a professor at Cambridge now. And um, just a week or so ago on Twitter, uh, he said that the experiment that we're uh, working towards doing in, in uh, balloon board experiment in Sweden, which we can talk about later, he said that us doing that was as bad as if we were helping the North Koreans build centrifuges. And, and so that's, and this is another, you know, really thoughtful, serious, no nonsense academic. I, and so that gives you a sense of how controversial. So I don't think it, there's 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 no way to there's no way it's just an objective fact that it's controversial. And and to be clear, I think there are good reasons for people to have deep concerns about this technology. And a central one is this kind of moral hazard or mitigation inhibition. Basically, the idea that people who want to oppose emissions cuts will use the promise of geoengineering as a kind of get out of jail free card. Uh, 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 to avoid emissions cuts. That is a central concern, no question at all. So uh, why did I write the book? I guess um, I was being involved more and more in public policy, more and more in discussions with big environmental groups. That's, I put a lot of time into that over the years, doing lots of technical papers as well. But I felt that um, 
you know, with so much controversy, trying to get things out in a more coherent way in a single short book would be good. It's a, it's a very short book. It's just a sort of third of a length of a regular book. I never tried to really write a long form piece of prose sort of for the general public before. And uh, I, I found it a really good experience. I'm right now during COVID been struggling with the idea that I'm writing a second version of it. And it's been slow, but uh, I enjoy doing that one. Oh, that's great. So you're a researcher, you're a public speaker, an entrepreneur, and also a mountain climber. So isn't that right? <laughs> yeah, I do climb a lot, yeah. Because <laughs> here you are, scaling what's called the Polar Circus in the Canadian Rockies. And you know, our last speaker, uh, Ben Santer, another climate science researcher, was also a mountain climber. So is there something about your profession that compels you to do this? Well, I don't know. So this, this picture, uh, uh, Polar Circus is actually one of the big prizes of the Rockies. It's a big route and it's, uh, it can be dangerous too if it's an avalanche risk. Um, I'll say one thing, I'm very proud that I'm climbing pretty hard as a 57 year old who has a professional job, but my climbing partner actually, you know, it's always a little humbling. You meet people, however, however good you think you are, He's got a professional job that's at least as intense as mine. He, he runs the um, uh, uh, ICU at Calgary Children's, one of the top doctor jobs in Canada. And he climbs ridiculously hard, huge record of, of big guys climbing. So um, that was a, a real treat to get to do that with him on a, on a, on a good route. Um, there is an interesting record of people who've been climbing who are environmentalists that goes way back. There's a nice book called Pilgrims of the Vertical that I'd recommend to anybody who's is interested in that world. It's a history that goes back through the Sierra Club and the environmental activism of some of the people who, who, uh, who were leading climbers. I mean, Schoenard uh, is an obvious example. So for whatever reason, maybe the sort of risk tolerance of people who climb plus love of the outdoors makes them more likely to be environmental activists. Yeah, well, I kind of figured that was the case, but it's, it's interesting to hear your story about that. Well, listen, hey, thanks for sharing this information with our audience. Um, now it's time for your presentation. So while you're presenting, I'll turn off my video um, and then you can share your screen and advance your slides. But when you're done and ready for the Q&A session, uh, just unshare your presentation, let me know and I'll rejoin you. Thanks um, and good luck. Very good. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Thanks, thanks just a whole lot. Um, and thanks to, to all of you listening. Um, so I want to start with just some of the big picture before I, I jump into slides. And to be clear, if there's some reason somebody needs to interrupt me, just go ahead. I'll, I'll keep my eyes on, on the Q&A and so on. So um, a very big picture is, is first of all, that, that these technologies cannot be a perfect substitute for avoiding emissions or for cutting emissions. Uh, uh, putting aerosols in the stratosphere is not anti-CO2. So in the long run, we have to cut emissions. But the evidence from, from climate models and, and a, a chain of, of, of physics, atmospheric science underneath it is I think stronger than many people would suppose and stronger than you think from a casual look at the, at the popular press. The evidence is stronger than you might suppose that these technologies could substantially reduce many of the key climate risks in a way that's really pretty even around the world. So they don't just reduce the risk of extreme temperature, but they reduce uh, uh, risks of, of, of changed water availability. You know, one fact about climate change is that wet regions get wetter and the dry regions get drier. There's strong evidence that these technologies could, could reverse that, could reverse sea level rise, could uh, re protect uh, crop yields, et cetera. I'll show you some of that evidence during the talk. But I think the bottom line is that evidence is surprisingly strong given what you read in the popular press. And, and there's a lot of things that are commonly visible about this technology that, that, that are, well, that aren't based on peer reviewed papers, for example. So if you just Google solar geoengineering, you will find an immense number of papers that talk about the risk of droughts. There may be risk of droughts, but there is not one peer reviewed paper that clearly outlines a drought risk from a, a uniform solar geo. Now, to be clear, I'm being a little tricky there because drought and aridity aren't quite the same thing. And, but the big picture is the gap between some of the statements about what the risks are and what we believe we think they are from, from uh, what studies have been done so far is, is pretty big. So I think there's some real kind of bias. And I think the bias is well-intentioned. The, the many people in the environmental science community and in the 
reporters who report on it and in the policymakers who are concerned with it are all fundamentally concerned about the fact that, that we humans are doing much less than we should to restrain emissions. And so this idea, this fear about a techno fix, I think is well-founded, but the problem is people are mixing up their well-founded fear of how these technologies could be misused with the actual facts of what we know about this technology. And that's not doing the public, uh, that's not fair to the public. What the public need is our best estimates with uncertainty about what the technologies do, which I think is much more positive than you might think, and our honest assessment about the political risks, which are very real. So I'll, I'll, I'll try and do some of that in this talk. Um, the last thing I wanna point out is that it's natural as you hear this, some of you for maybe the first time to leap to the question of should we do it or not? Should we implement these technologies? And there's no question that question is hanging over this. But this is a step-by-step -step process. And the real political battle right now uh, uh, is about whether we should have a serious research program, whether we should know more. So that's what, say, my, my friend and colleague Ray Pierre Humbert is arguing that we should not. And I think it's important to say that it is simply not true that everything we research ends up getting done. And it is legitimate to say that we could know more and that could inform future decisions, but it just does not bind the hands of the future. It is possible to know more without inexorably moving towards doing something. And the big question really is, should there be a serious international open access research program to really understand this technology better? My view is very much that they should, uh, and, and I'll try to make that case toward the end of the talk. So um, let me start with the basics. These are some of the technologies that are most relevant for solar geoengineering, that some of the solar geoengineering technologies, and I will not treat them all uh, in detail at all, but I just want to give you some sense of the total set of these technologies. So going down from the top of the app, the, the, the top to the bottom, um, you could in principle put reflective aerosols in, or <clears throat> put reflective structures in outer space uh, at the Lagrange point in between the earth and the sun where they would reflect away a little bit of sunlight. I think this is utterly implausible say before 2050, but this problem, is, as you'll see later, is sort of a century and a half problem. And I think it's not crazy to think about doing that in the second half of the century. And it's particularly feels a little different in the last decade with the really uh, real improvement in, in space technology. So there's been some now quite high level meetings about it. Next down is the idea that you could put uh, aerosols, fine particles into the stratosphere, say about um, 20 kilometers over our heads, round numbers, where they stay in the stratosphere for a year or two. And that could be sulfate aerosol, sulfuric acid, or a range of other aerosols, calcium carbonate or diamond or what have you. Um, all those things have, have that same lifetime of a, of, a, of a year or two. All those things inherently tend to be pretty even uh, east to west and, and can be made even north to south. Um, then going down further, there's um, the idea that cirrus clouds, it's possible to um, possibly uh, uh, reduce the density of some cirrus clouds. And, uh, there's an interesting little bit of physics. So, so um, low clouds, low white clouds tend to cool the earth. If there are more light clouds, the earth is being cooled because it's reflecting more sunlight back. But high clouds have both a cooling and a warming property. The cooling property is just reflecting sunlight, but the warming property is that they are infrared, uh, 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 partially opaque. And so they kind of act as a, uh, in the same way that CO2 does by increasing the infrared opacity as a greenhouse effect, although that's actually not how greenhouses work. Um, so, so if you thin cirrus, you let more infrared out and that could be a very uh, effective way, but there are big uncertainties about the extent to which it actually would happen. Then there's the idea that you could make certain kinds of marine stratus clouds, like the clouds that you see in a cloud deck off, off the say west coast of Seattle. You could make those clouds whiter by adding um, cloud condensation nuclei, small uh, sea salt. Um, and then finally, there's a bunch of ground-based ideas. So um, there's an idea that something called the Arctic Ice Project is put forward of putting little um, 100 micron glass beads on Arctic sea ice. We've actually been analyzing th that recently. I think we, we be kind of believe it's a little uh, overstated and maybe riskier than people think, but it's certainly a, an idea that's out there and there are other surface ideas. So I guess you some sense of the kind of set of, of, of ideas that are there, but I'm gonna focus first of all on, on stratospheric sulfates. So um, hold on, I'm oops, sorry. A little confused about talk order here. Um, 
one sec, let me go back in. Um, so, um, so what I want to do in, in thinking about this is um, think about a benchmark scenario, first of all. And so I'll describe first just in sort of simple technical terms of what this benchmark scenario is. Then I'll say a little bit about what it does. And then I'll kind of expand the frame again uh, 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 to talk about how that might fit into a larger uh, policy for dealing with climate change. So, so starting with this narrow thing, I'm going to say, what would it take and what would the consequences be if we did two watts per square meter of radiative forcing globally using these technologies? You might say, what the heck is two watts per square meter? So a watt per square meter is just what you might think, one watt per every square meter. That's a measure of the radiative forcing. It's a common way that we think about how much humans, how much anthropogenic forcing there is of climate. And to give you a sense, uh, two times CO2 is of order four watts per square meter. Uh, you may have heard of these RCP scenarios, these standard scenarios for how um, human forcing of climate might evolve over time. So uh, a high scenario is RCP 8.5 or an RCP 4.5 is a lower scenario. And those numbers, 8.5 or 4.5, are watts per square meter. Um, so as we'll get to later, two watts per square meter might be a reasonable scenario of solar geoengineering is being added to a situation where we're cutting emissions pretty steeply to reduce risks. So uh, what would it mean to do that? To do that, you could, could achieve it by putting something like a million and a half tons of sulfur a year. David, David excuse me. Do you know yes. that you're, you're no longer sharing your screen? Uh, thank you very much. I uh, actually was part of probably just fine that I wasn't, but I did <laughs> I think, sorry, I apologize. I'll get back on track in just a second. I think I messed up. Sorry about this. I apologize. I think I had two slightly different presentations open and I got confused. Let me see if I've got this right now. Um, yeah, let me jump back in. Um, um, I'll just be a second, I apologize for this. Technical glitch. Um, thank you for pointing that out. There you go. So I should be sharing again now. So what would it mean to achieve this scenario? So you need to put about one and a half million tons a year of sulfur in the stratosphere. And so, uh, and, and you know, I think there's now quite a lot of, of evidence from several different studies that all kind of converge to the fact that, that you could do that using commercial off the shelf, shelf aircraft technologies. So that's not the same as commercial off the shelf aircraft. There aren't aircraft today that do this easily, but you could design aircraft using commercial engines and commercial design techniques to do this. And you know, the basic facts are you need something of order of 100 aircraft and you'd ramp it up. You wouldn't start with that. You'd start with 10 and ramp yourself up over 30 years or something. Um, and uh, this gives you a sense of what the cost is. And then there's sort of, sort of key comparisons. So Pinatubo in eruption in 1991 put about 8 million tons a year of sulfur in the stratosphere. I think that's a very important comparison because I will show you lots of model results, but I'm suspicious of models. And I think the big question about solar geoengineering is not so much what all our models tell us, it's what are the unknown unknowns? What's the possibility that our models are just wrong? And I think one of the comforting facts about using sulfur, which is lots of things to criticize, but a good thing about using sulfur is it's sort of the devil we know. There's a, a, a experience with nature putting sulfur in the stratosphere. There's a huge amount of science on sulfur in the stratosphere over, over many decades. And we have some empirical knowledge from this uh, Pinatubo um, experiment or Pinatubo eruption of what 8 million tons does. And that gives us some, I think, confidence in the upper limit on what the unknown unknowns would be in terms of the um, chemical, geochemical impacts of, of putting that sulfur in the stratosphere. It's also important to compare that to global emissions of sulfur in the lower atmosphere, which are now going down quite quickly. In fact, this number is a little out of date. Um, uh, because of air pollution control, most noticeably in China, which is wonderful. And sulfur, along with other air pollutants in the lower atmosphere, kill something of order 8 million people a year from farm cricket air pollution. So this gives you a sense of the kind of risk people are playing with. Um, um, it's also worth talking about the cost. You might say 100 aircraft seems like a lot, but to give you a sense, uh, there are 40 million commercial flights a year. Obviously, that was pre-COVID, and we'll see what happens after COVID. So it gives you a sense of kind of the scale of these things. All right, so that's a little bit on the benchmark scenario um, costs. Now, let me say a little bit about uh, where we'd inject it and then about what it does. So I, I mentioned that injection would be 
uh, sort of about 20 kilometers, this gives you a sense of why. It's a very simple schematic of, of a cross section of the atmosphere. The stratosphere um, starts at something of order 16, 18 kilometers in the tropics, and it's pretty flat layer in the tropics. And above that in the stratosphere, air tends to rise and then sink towards the, 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 the winter hemisphere and shifts back and forth this season, obviously. The tropopause is much lower in the um, uh, near the poles, and it's also lower in the winter. So if you fly between North America and and uh, Europe, if you do that, especially in the winter, you're you're quite well into the stratosphere, well up here, but not into this uh, thing we often call the overworld, the upper stratosphere, which really doesn't mix with the troposphere so much. And that's the one where lifetimes are, are, are more of the order of two years. So that's the, the rationale. And the rationale is that if you inject in this tropical region, not necessarily perfectly evenly, you can get a pretty even north to south and east to west coverage of aerosols. And there's evidence from models that gives you some confidence about that. So what are some direct impacts of the benchmark scenario? This isn't talking about what good it would do, it's talking about what, it, what, what are the impacts. So an obvious concern for a long time has been that uh, 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 putting sulfate aerosol can accelerate ozone loss that is caused by the uh, uh, halocarbons, the, the chlorofluorocarbons that make chlorine in the stratosphere, which have been the cause of, of ozone loss. And it's not, in a sense, directly that the uh, sulfuric acid destroys ozone, or there's an element of that. It's really that the, the sulfuric acid makes the chlorine that we've put there more effective in destroying ozone, makes more of it in the active chlorine monoxide form. And uh, that's certainly real, but that risk is gets less with time because uh, the Montreal Protocol is re releasing, reducing the amount of, of chlorine in the stratosphere. So that gives you a sense of what the numbers are. There's also uh, um, the idea that if you're putting aerosols in the stratosphere, the aerosols are gonna come down to the surface and you gotta think about what the, um, the, the, the risk is at the surface. Um, and this gives you a sense of what those numbers are. Those numbers, when you just look at them, are big. And there's no question that, that you know, if you're talking about doing this and it would cause um, something like 11,000 deaths a year, if you look at that, and that's a very big number. And I think you have to take it seriously morally that you'd be making decisions that have those consequences. But it's also true that these are all sort of epidemiological um, uh, small changes in, in relatively small changes in, in rates, and that those changes are small compared to other changes that would come from doing this. Uh, so the estimates are that the reduction in, I'll skip ahead, the reduction in, in, in mortality from the temperature effects of climate would be much bigger than that. That's a benefit of this. That is, uh, the estimates are that climate related from warming mortality in the US alone, even with air conditioning late this century are of order 60,000 a year. And there's a bunch of really nice um, epidemiological data uh, about that tell us something about these temperature impacts. Happy to talk about that later. So in comparison, that gives you a sense of the scale. I'll go back a slide and give you a sense of the complexity. Um, these are, there's a bunch of complex feedbacks. When we started this research about what the uh, impacts are of aerosols, I just thought, well, if people are talking about putting aerosols in the stratosphere, we better think about the air pollution consequences. And I worked with a group that was an expert in that, and we thought just about the direct consequences. Uh, that's this direct black line here. But it turns out that all these indirect lines turn out to be bigger, that basically the sulfate aerosols reduces climate change and reduced climate change changes the way air pollution works at the surface, which changes um, ground level ozone, for example. All right, let me jump ahead to what this does. So let's say that you did this two watts per square meter, which would be a complement, not a substitute to cutting emissions. That is, it's not as if we do solar geoengineering and don't cut emissions. What I'm talking about proposing is the idea that we do it as well as cutting emissions as a complement. As, uh, um, and this gives you some sense of what it would do. So the evidence is that it would reduce regional changes in water availability. So climate change tends to, as I said at the beginning, change water availability. This tends to change it back on a, on a, on a local basis. Uh, it, it actually reduces extreme precipitation more than does reducing CO2 to achieve the same temperature uh, reduction. That sounded complicated. Let me say it uh, differently. If you achieve the same reduction in temperature by reducing CO2, as you do by reducing uh, a temperature by solar geoengineering, the temperature reduction by solar geoengineering is more effective in reducing extreme precipitation. So a world where you've done this complement uh, tends to damp extreme precipitation like hurricanes more strongly or tropical cyclones. Same with extreme temperatures, it turns out. So let me show you a little bit of, of data. So this, first of all, 
uh, uh, is data that just shows data. This is data from a model, obviously. Uh, shows you predicted change in surface air temperature over land under a couple different scenarios. So first of all, the red is two times CO2. So this is something you would have seen lots of times before if you think about climate change. And this shows you the range of temperatures is by location. So some locations in this particular model see four and a half degrees C temperature rise, which is really big. Some locations see temperature rises that are that are much more, more like a degree and a half. There's some median. If you uh, reduce the average change by roughly a half by cutting sunlight by 1% in a model like this, you, you reduce uh, the surface air temperature change and, and same with the, these other variables. But that, that we sort of knew. What we didn't know so much is what does it do to the extremes in the distribution? And the really interesting news now that people are looking carefully at these state-of-the-art models is that solar geomission really does reduce the extremes. But even here, if you look at this, it's, it's possible that there are some uh, parts of the world that move, um, if you like, from here to here. They move in a way so that even though the mean has been reduced, some areas of the world are made worse off. And politically, a central question of any policy is who's made worse off? So we tried to get at it this way. We use some standard um, way to divide the world up into regions that the IPCC has used, the so-called SREX regions. And for each of the regions, we focused on four variables, temperature, extreme temperature is the hottest hour in a year, precipitation minus evaporation, which is a measure of how much moisture there is, and extreme precipitation, the, the wettest five days in a year. So those are the five vari four variables we used. And there's a lot of evidence from standard IPCC literature and so on that those are among the most important variables in driving the climate impacts that matter to people. And then for each of the regions, we, we looked at the following. We asked whether doing solar geoengineering on top of the, the, the CO2 driven climate change, whether doing solar geoengineering tend to make that variable go towards the pre-industrial or away from the pre-industrial. So if it's moving towards the pre-industrial, we say that it's moderated, which means less climate change, which in general is better and exacerbated the opposite. We're using moderated and exacerbated because as you'll see, better or worse is at some level in the eye of the beholder. Um, but so, so this is a, a, gonna be a measure of the extent to which uh, um, uh, solar geoengineering evenly uh, makes changes. And what we were kind of expecting to see is that there would be a bunch of regions that were made worse off and that we've tagged them with statistical significance. Uh, so the strong blue are things that are um, moderated statistically significantly and the strong red are things that would be statistically significantly exacerbated. And there are no strong red symbols. Now, whether that is true in the real world, I have no idea but it is legitimately the answer from a state-of-the-art model. And I can show you some other related answers. And it's pretty consistent across now every climate model people have looked at that, that you get this very widespread, not just local reduction in most of the big climate hazards. And that is the real reason to take these technologies seriously in my view. Um, this is a, a place where we did exactly the, the same analysis method as in the last figure but this time, uh, the last figure was with a model that's very good in terms of being very high resolution, but we were using a very simple model for solar geoengineering, which is just turn down the sun. This is a model that's a little bit lower resolution, but has a better stratosphere. And in this case, the model was uh, uh, using a model version of sulfate aerosols. And in this version, there actually are four regions, I'm pointing them out here, where uh, pre minus e water availability is exacerbated. But interestingly enough, in all of those cases, uh, the exacerbation is to make it wetter. So that's why I said you should be cautious about what's better or worse. So my guess is that uh, probably for this region, the US actually wetter would be worse, but uh, many people, not necessarily desert organisms, but people in say this region might actually prefer a little more water availability. Um, we sea level rise. Um, that's a surprising one. So you'll see claims that solar geoengineering makes ocean acidification worse, or they, uh, um, I believe they're, they're, they're not correct or they're assuming a, um, um, assuming a political reaction, which may or may not be true, but they're not a technical statement. So, so here's the reason why um, solar geoengineering would reduce carbon concentrations a little bit. It's because of carbon cycle feedbacks. So carbon emissions, mean more carbon in the atmosphere. More carbon in the atmosphere means a warmer world. More world, warmer world means less carbon absorbed by the ocean, more carbon released by permafrost, et cetera. Those are the carbon cycle feedbacks. That's standard. Well, there's lots of uncertainty about them. Those are in many different models. And, and if you compare two worlds, 
both of which have the same human emissions of carbon, one of which had some solar geoengineering, the world with some solar geoengineering would have less carbon cycle feedbacks, and that world would have a lower concentration of carbon at the end of the century. So it's not a big effect. The bottom line is the carbon concentration driven by emissions, and we have to bring emissions down. But solar geoengineering does reduce emissions a little bit, reduce uh, concentrations a little bit over the century, or it could. Um, of course, it reduces global average temperature, the one thing that essentially nobody disagrees about. Um, why should you believe any of this? Um, I think the strongest reason is really that the slide's out of date. It's now been actually 21 years this year um, since the first climate model study of solar geoengineering was Ken Caldera's uh, uh, first study, where he was actually trying to show that solar geoengineering wouldn't work and it would be very uneven. And there's, I think, been a healthy bias in the scientific community to look for problems. And yet, I think that there's no strong published evidence that contradicts the conclusions I gave. Important caveat, the conclusions I gave were for solar geoengineering in this kind of two watts per square meter and spatially uniform way. There is no question that you could use these technologies in ways that were deliberately harmful, uh, uh, say by doing much more of them or doing them only in one region, which would make other regions change more unequally. So it's, I'm not saying that it's that the evidence is that solar geoengineering just as an abstract thing would necessarily do this. But if we chose to do solar geoengineering in a way that was spatially uniform, or roughly uniform, I could quantify that, and it was a complement to emission cuts, then you would get uh, this result, I believe. Um, this is some yet unpublished data uh, about crop yields with one of the, what appears to be the very best crop model that's built into a, uh, the NCAR, National Center for Atmosphere Research, GCM. And uh, I, I very much like the, the framework we've adopted for this model, which was to compare different ways between going from this RCP 8.5 scenario, this very high emission scenario, and RCP 4.5 scenario. And what we compare is making that change by cutting emissions or by three different kinds of solar geoengineering. And I think that's a nice sort of consistent way to do it because it's not comparing a world where we do or don't have emissions. Uh, it's comparing it in a kind of systematic way. And um, uh, what we're asking is, what are the relative effectiveness of those different actions in uh, protecting crop yields? So in an RCP 8.5 world, crop yields go down. And the question is, what do these different things do to protect them? So that's average crop yields here. You can skip the rest of this for now. That's what average crop yields do in the RCP 8.5. That's what they do in RCP 4.5. And that's what they do with 8.5 and SRM. So the point is that, that the solar geoengineering is actually more effective than emissions cuts in protecting crop yields. And that's basically because of both the direct and a bunch of complicated indirect effects of, of the CO2 effect on, on, uh, on crops. Um, so now I want to sort of step back and say, um, how does this all fit into climate policy? So I've told you a little bit about a technology. I've told you something about this one two watts per square meter case, giving you some examples of what it might do. But I want to step back and say, like, how does this fit into the big picture of, of what humans might do about climate change? So here's a simple schematic for what the climate problem is, the simplest version, I believe. And even that um, leaves things out. So this has only the impact of climate on human welfare, but at least I believe that it's useful to think about the impact on the natural world in some way that's not just the sum of, of human welfare. I think the natural world matters on its own. Um, this is a slightly more complicated but more useful version. And let me take a minute to go through it because this is really the key of understanding the climate problem. Uh, it's this business where the economy drives emissions. That's the amount of carbon that goes in each year, gigatons a year, which drives concentrations. That's the parts per million of CO2 and the, the climate feels concentrations, which are basically integral of emissions. Um, that drives climate change and that drives the climate impacts that, that, that we care about or that impact the natural world. So there are four ways to intervene. And in a, in a paper I've written recently with, with John Deutsch for the Aspen Institute, which is available now, we call this learning to think in four dimensions, the four dimensions of climate policy. So the first dimension is decarbonization. That's the idea that we um, change the industrial infrastructure of the planet from a high emissions infrastructure, high, high emissions capital stock to a zero emissions capital stock to make the economy independent from emissions. There is no question we have to do that. There's no question we can do it. Uh, uh, but it's not going to happen overnight. It's inherently a hard thing to do. That's decarbonization. Then we can do carbon removal. These are ways to, to take carbon out of the atmosphere 
um, big range of ways. I was involved commercially in one of them, founding this company, Carbon Engineering, which contributes to one particular version of, of that. But there's a host of ways that carbon removal could work. I'll get to some of them in a minute. Uh, but I think it's fair to say that in general, it will be comparatively expensive and slow. Then there's solar geoengineering, which uh, um, partially breaks the link between concentrations and climate change. So, the, so decarbonization breaks the link between economic activity and emissions. Carbon removal breaks the link between emissions and concentrations. Solar geoengineering at best partially and imperfectly breaks, or I should say weakens the link between concentrations and climate change. And then adaptation are all the local things we can do to reduce impacts. And I think the question is, these are the, the basic four high level categories of, of tools for acting on the climate problem. And my view is it's certain we should decarbonize. It's very likely in the long run, we wanna do carbon removal to, to reduce the long-term carbon concentrations. Adaptation happens locally, more of it should happen. I don't think we know for sure that we should do solar geoengineering. I just think the evidence that it could that, that it used as part of a strategy could reduce risk that the evidence is high and that it's high enough that, that it justifies us doing much more research. Um, so let me talk a little bit about, about um, carbon removal for a second. Uh, this is a big messy list of carbon removal technologies, many of which you would have seen before, very high profile stuff right now. Um, um, but this list is deliberately messy and it mixes up things that are fundamentally different. My view is under this list, there are really two categories of things. One category are things that are, that are fundamentally short-term, um, uh, basically planting trees or enrichment of soil carbon, for example. Uh, and these things I think uh, are not negative emissions in a deep way. They're more like carbon banking. I'll, I'll get to why. If you think about what drives the climate problem, the climate problem is ultimately driven by us moving carbon from the geosphere, if you like, from deep underground carbon that's been in, in geologic reservoirs to the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels. But then the atmosphere and the land biosphere, that's all the trees and, and surface soil, that equilibrates on a relatively quick time scale and it's dynamic. And then there's also dynamic connections between the atmosphere and the ocean, okay? So, so that's mostly outside our control. The thing that, that drives climate change is doing this. And to me, real negative emissions, if you're talking negative emissions, you're talking about something that undoes this arrow, that goes the other way around. Um, uh, what I think these things are, which are about shifting between these reservoirs. So if you plant trees, you're shifting between the atmospheric reservoir and the land biosphere, but it can shift back the other way. If the climate warms, if there are wildfires, if people have changed their mind about the trees, uh, uh, that carbon will come back out. So my view is that these things here would be better called carbon banking or delayed emissions. That is not saying that this is good and this is bad. I think they're both potentially good and important things. They just do something different and we should not fool ourselves they're the same. To put this bluntly, if you fly across the ocean and emit a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, no amount of buying trees will undo the long-term risk you've passed on to your great-great-grandchildren by mobilizing a ton of carbon and burning it. You could reduce short-term risk a little bit with this, but the long-term geologic risk is there. If you actually take that carbon out and put it back in the geosphere, that really has undone that long-term risk. But to be clear, that doesn't mean all these things here are good because some of these things may have big costs or big environmental side effects. Um, uh, I just think there's two categories of things and I think that's really important to bear in mind when we talk about carbon removal. So let me talk a little bit about how things might roll over time. Um, the most important single thing to know about climate change is that um, climate change is basically proportional to the cumulative emissions of carbon dioxide. It's a stock and flow problem, it's cumulative. That means the instant that we stop the emissions completely, climate change does not go away, it just stops getting worse. So basically the moment you stop emissions, not quite, but more or less, temperatures stop rising, the risk to, to, to ice sheets will keep, keep rising for quite a long time, but temperatures more or less stop rising right away. But, but they stop wherever you are. It's a cumulative problem. Removing carbon can gradually pull the risk right down. But on my view is that's something that happens over a century or, or, or more as we gradually pull carbon concentrations back towards wherever humans decide to put them. I would vote for pre-industrial. So the combination of emissions cuts and carbon removal will get us some curve like this. You'll see this is without any units, it's just conceptual. My view is that the most uh, uh, sensible, um, ethical way to think about solar geoengineering is as a way to 
uh, uh, cut the top off that curve to, to, to reduce the peak of the climate risk. And now I've showed you that conceptually. Now I want to show it to you with numbers. So um, I'll show it to you with the results from a, a so-called integrated assessment model. Um, this is a, a modification of the Nordhaus uh, model. Nordhaus won the Nobel Prize uh, recently for, for a range of things, but a central one being developing this model early on. It and a bunch of things that are the children of DICE or its competitors have become really central in the debates about, uh, about, about how we think about long-term climate policy. You may have heard about um, uh, the social cost of carbon. The social cost of cal carbon calculations basically come out of integrated assessment models like this. So these models are, are integrated assessment in the sense that they include some model of the economic production and energy and some model of, of the climate um, and damages in a coupled way. This makes the model sound very complicated. Actually, what I like about DICE is it's ridiculously simple. It doesn't have much in it. I think it's very unrealistic, but I think it's useful for telling stories. And my view is actually some of the more complicated uh, uh, integrated assessment models add a lot of complexity, but maybe not a lot of, of, of robustness. So just to give you just a little sense, this is the actual climate and carbon cycle model in DICE. It's really just those equations and nothing more. The climate model is really just a two-layer stock and flow model and the carbon cycle model is a three-layer model. It's just that simple. This is the uh, marginal cost model that we put in. So standard DICE doesn't do carbon removal in, in a self-consistent way as a, as, a, as a separate technology. We put that in because we think it's important. And this is how we parameterized carbon removal. And, and then of course, standard DICE doesn't put in solar geoengineering. Now the question is how to do it. If you just put, so, so standard DICE just has a single thing, temperature, and then temperature damages the economy in a way that's quadratic in temperature. So the economic damage is proportional to temperature squared. Um, if, if you just put in solar geoengineering to that model and solar geoengineering definitely changes global temperature, then solar geoengineering would be perfect. And it would completely remove the damages from climate change. That is certainly not true. And so the, the innovation in the work that we've done, I believe, is to put in a simple but uh, empirically based parameterization for how solar geoengineering works. And that's based on a kind of linearization. So I showed you some climate model results, this little image I showed you earlier. You could do that with a thousand grid points. We have more or less the climate model responds linearly to inputs like solar geoengineering or, or the amount of CO2 in the air. You can linearize the model uh, and they really are quite linear. I'm happy to answer questions about that. And when you do that, you can sort of think about it as a vector model. And I, I'll, I'll skip through some of this, but just to say that in general, if you have you know, a thousand grid points and you've got whatever your variable was, precip or extreme temperature, um, if all those grid points are linearly proportional to, to, to CO2, that's a vector in this thousand dimensional space. And if they're linearly proportional to solar geo, that's another vector in this thousand dimensional space. And you, you can express how well solar geoengineering works by one thing, the angle between it and CO2 driven warming. And we have empirical tests of that angle from climate models. So um, that's the, the key thing that we put into the model. And um, this shows you the result of the model for an angle of 30 degrees. I'll get to what that means in a second, but this is the, the model telling us what it thinks optimal policy is. To be clear, this is an optimal policy for a world with a single um, um, omniscient uh, benevolent dictator, which is pretty obviously not the world we live in. And we can talk about how relevant this is in the real world uh, later on. But this gives you a sense of, of how the model is making decisions, how it's handling mitigation. This is business as usual. So this is all cutting emissions. This is CDR, which happens basically in the model. You don't really do CDR until you've mostly cut emissions to zero. And this is how it's used solar geoengineering. Uh, this gives you a sense of the policy comes, costs. So you can do that in different ways for different versions of this angle parameter. Where if the angle is 90 degrees, then solar geoengineering is doing nothing. If the angle is zero degrees, it's close to perfect. So here's the answer for zero degrees. It's not quite perfect because we have a separate additional damage term of just the direct damages of solar geoengineering. Um, as the angle gets bigger, solar geoengineering gets more useless and gets squeezed out of the model. That's the kind of result you get from one of these optimal models. What is that angle for real? Well, we don't know, but climate damages in these models are dominated by extreme temperatures. There's a lot of evidence extreme temperatures harm humans directly and harm economies. And uh, uh, that angle for temperatures in the models is, is more like 10 degrees. So, so that would say that solar geoengineering works very well. Whether it actually does or not, we can argue about. 
I want to wrap up here pretty quickly and, and, and get to questions. I think that's the best part. But I want to drive home one thing that I think may be hiding under here that may be surprising. So many people, if you ask them, would think that carbon removal was something we should really think about. There's a lot of interest, a lot of, a lot of commercial interest in carbon removal right now. A lot of people think you sort of do that first and that, that, that solar geoengineering is something that sort of if carbon removal fails. I think that is profoundly the wrong way to think about it. I think that if we're going to use solar geoengineering, we don't know whether we should, it should happen first. Here's why. If you think about back to the simple version of this, but it re replicates what's in the model, you know, emission, when emissions cuts start, which we're now past, we really are making progress now. That's sort of the deviation between a kind of business as usual and what happens. Um, uh, uh, all of this centers around whatever is this day of net zero, where presumably we'll have global celebrations. And the day of net zero, when net emissions are zero, is basically not quite the same, but more or less the day with peak temperatures and peak climate risks. So my view, as I said, is solar geoengineering, if you wanted to cut off the top, you want to start it early, well before the peak. And in the model, it starts much earlier. And then you want to stop it as you gradually pull carbon dioxide concentrations back down with carbon removal. So, so it starts early, well before the peak. Carbon removal, on the other hand, maybe a little bit of it starts early. It should, I mean, some's already happening now. But I think large scale carbon removal, in my view, doesn't really make sense until we've done most of squeezing the carbon out of the economy. Maybe until we squeeze two thirds or three quarters of it out. So it happens uh, near the peak. So the big lesson here for me is that solar geoengineering actually starts before large scale carbon removal at scale. So. This is all kind of somewhat technocratic rationalist point of view. Here are some of the actual comments that, that, that people have about it. And um, in that very nice introduction, I mentioned that I've been part of some debates, but actually one particularly interesting one is I did kind of was on stage with Al Gore uh, um, talking through this about three years ago at the last of the weekend with Charlie Rose, if I can admit it. And uh, you know, I think it's clear that, that Al Gore, I think it, it's been such a leader on climate in some ways, his view is, is very much not based on technical risk, but based on this concern about moral hazard. And to be clear, Al Gore was very much against any effort on climate adaptation a long time ago, as were many other climate leaders that they've generally changed their tune now and think adaptation is important. And they were against adaptation for the same reason as they're against solar geoengineering, because it distracts from cutting emissions. But I think the answer for adaptation was no. Adaptation is not distracted from cutting emissions. If anything, the intense need to do adaptation has focused people on the need to cut emissions. I think we have to ask how, we have to, we have to question our confidence that solar geoengineering would necessarily distract from emissions cuts. And I think I wanna actually just stop there and begin to get uh, 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 questions and answers going. So I'm happy to talk more about what the risks are of solar geoengineering and to talk about experiments that we're doing but I think from my perspective, getting a few questions out would really be helpful to get a sense of where the audience is. David, that was great. So, okay. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd like you to do maybe just to kind of set the stage for all this is to give us kind of a quick recap regarding the major non geoengineering strategies for slowing down and ultimately reducing global warming. Uh, and, and put each of them in perspective in terms of the magnitude of the effort, the, you know, which is easier to do first or whatever like that. You've already alluded to some of these things in the presentation, but I think it might be good to just put it all in a nutshell right now. With the three major strategies, I think, being eliminating emissions altogether, uh, implementing negative emission strategies of some kind or another and getting us to net zero faster, um, and then implementing carbon remo removal, assuming it's totally out of the atmosphere. It's only out of the atmosphere, right? Um, which, which I think we understand is very, very large, very expensive, and, and quite long term relative to some other things we might do. If that's correct. So, what do you what do you say about those things? Um, so, so I think of there being two things there, not three, but maybe I missed something. I feel like the central thing we do is decarbonization, and and to me. Um, decarbonization is, is all about uh, um, changing the primary energy source. And I think, I mean, just to give you some sense of how I think about that, I think the, um, uh, if you ask, I mean, I think we want the world to have more access to energy. There's still roughly 800 million people who have no access to electricity, for example. Uh, uh, 
uh, energy can be profoundly important in, in bettering human welfare and, and even in reducing some other environmental impacts. So I think we, we should want some of the world's poor to get access to more energy. I think the key thing is that we make that energy carbon neutral. And I think if, if you imagine a world that is gonna have more energy use than now, uh, so we're now at uh, 16 terawatts or whatever, um, the number changes, and I've lost track of what's the right number today. Um, um, if you want to get to a world that's really uh, 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 has a lot more energy and some more population, you're looking at well over 20 terawatts late, late this century. And if you want that to be carbon free, I think there are really only two things that are primary energy sources that could scale to anything like that scale without having big subsidiary environmental impacts. And that's solar power and nuclear power. So I think if you think about some of the other things like biofuels or hydropower, um, um, or wind power, which is sort of intermediate, I think it's very hard to scale that big without significant impacts. So to me, it, it really is it. And, and I think, uh, to be clear, you could do it with either. There's no question you could do it with all solar. Uh, and the, the progress in reducing the cost of solar is stunning. Um, uh, uh, but I think that's, that's the big picture. And um, so I mean, I'm not quite understanding the question, but I think the, the central issue is, is, is decarbonization. Happy to talk more about that. I've done lots of work on energy systems. And then the other issue is carbon removal. Right. Yeah, I guess when I said negative emissions, I'm thinking of pulling, uh, of storing carbon, if you will, uh, through various means, the most obvious one being, you know, with reforestation, you know, and that kind of thing. So, um, so, so other, maybe this is other things have been proposed too. Yeah, so I'm not sure what, I, so, so at least the way I think about it, there's, first of all, there's some confusion in terms. To me, carbon removal is broadly the set of things we do to take carbon from the atmosphere back to some reservoir. Okay. So, so as I said in the talk, I think, there are some things that take it to really permanent reservoirs. So that would be um, either direct air capture, this thing where I had to have the self-interest, direct air capture uh, plus, plus deep, deep injection into geological reservoirs, or biomass energy with carbon capture and storage and deep injection into geological reservoirs, or adding alkaline, alkalinity to the ocean, which also is effectively permanent on geological timescales. So those are examples of things that are scalable and really do permanent removal. Then there's all these things that are kind of ecosystem management, some of which I think no question have real benefits, but they're really not permanent removal. They're kind of about trajectory management in my view, say, say planting trees. Okay. Um, I guess I think all of those are different from conventional carbon capture and storage, which to me is about, um, carbon capture and storage is about one of the ways that we could make products with less CO2 emissions. So if you do a natural gas plant with carbon capture and storage, that's basically competing with a nuclear plant or with a solar plant with storage. Right. They, both, the, all, all of them are making carbon neutral electricity. And the issue is just what are their costs and what are their other environmental impacts? Right. Uh, none of them are in a net removing carbon from the atmosphere, which is what carbon removal does. Okay, so you really mainly see it as emissions and carbon renewal carbon removal all in all kinds of various forms, some of which are easier to do in the short term, some of which are very, very long term. Yeah, that's how I, yep, that's how I, that's how I think it makes sense to divide up the landscape, but happy to hear other ideas. Yeah, but well, so with, you know, you founded carbon engineering with a, under the premise of taking carbon dioxide out of the air and converting it to a, a fuel. What, do you see that as a very, very long-term kind of proposition, or do you see more promise in that technology early on? Uh, well, I mean, commercially, we see this as a short-term. We're trying to uh, uh, close financing on a, a first plant that would be of order half a million tons a year. And uh, I think there's a real hope we get the final investment decision on a complete plant with a full engineering wrap and the whole deal done in less than one year. So that's a very real thing. Uh, when we start talking about gigatons, now we're talking about a much longer and larger proposition, I guess, right? Sure, but that's true for anything. Yeah. So, so, so I think if, if the question is, are there some carbon removal technologies which, which so, 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 as is with different hats, uh, from the perspective of, of a fewer sort of omniscient decision maker, I think the answer is we don't need to really do gigaton scale carbon removal for a long time, but if we want to have the chance to do gigaton carbon removal in, in say, twenty fifty. We, given the 
on certain pieces of technology though, we should really start some megaton projects soon so we see who's right and who's wrong. So, you know, we at Carbon Engineering think our particular thing costs whatever it costs, $150 a ton or whatever, uh, but why should you believe us? At some level, as much as we think we've been really done a good job and we're honest, the proof of the pudding is actually doing it. Yeah. And, and so, but the point is building a bunch of million ton a year plants really shakes it out, starts the learning curve, helps you understand what it is. And my, my company, the company I founded has one technology. There's other technologies that are very serious as well. There's a range of different ideas. I don't want to claim that carbon engineering has got the magic answer, but the point is collectively, socially, I think there's a real benefit to trying some of these things out. So we shake out the cost of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, I just don't think that, that, that uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of claims that it's necessary to remove say 10 gigatons a year by 2050. Those claims come from a particular, I think incorrect reading of the IPCC 1.5 report and also from assuming that solar geoengineering doesn't exist. Uh, so I think those claims are a little overstated, but, but I do think we wanna develop the cap capacity to do carbon removal. Uh, Direct air capture, the, the technology of getting CO2 from the air making concentrated stream could be used both for carbon removal and for making fuels. And I think those are both potentially important uses. Right. So I think then I mean, partly what I was getting at, I think, is that the that reduction of emissions is a really tough job all by itself. And it's not going quite according to plan, right? And then you have carbon removal, which is a even larger longer term challenge. And that's the reason why you believe that cutting the top off the peak with a, a technology like solar geoengineering makes sense because uh, of the, the egregious effect that high temperatures have on the economy, on people's health and all kinds of things like that. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, all the climate risks we, we care about. I think, I think that, I think the key point, I think people often think about solar geoengineering as, as a if then. So it's commonly think about it as if all else fails is one way to think about it. I think very unhelpful way to think about it. Another way to think about it is that, that the decision is all bound up in the decision of how good a job we do cut emissions. The more I think about it, I actually think it's pretty independent from how good a job we cut emissions. Fundamentally, in any public policy decision, you evaluate the world with that, without the decision, the world with the decision, and you compare them. That's sort of decision analysis 101. Yep. And I think the fundamental about solar geoengineering is how do the risks of solar geoengineering, which are real, I'm happy to talk more about them, how the risks of solar geoengineering compare to the benefits in terms of reduced risk from warming. Yep. And even if emissions were eliminated today, if there were no emissions tomorrow morning, we'd still have the CO2 that's in the air now. We'd still have the real climate warming we have now with real impacts, especially in the Arctic, but impacts that are real today. And it still might make sense, even if there were no more emissions, to do a small amount of solar geoengineering, gradually tapering it off over time to reduce the peak climate risk and reduce the rate of change. Uh, and, and that decision would really be a decision about the benefits of reduced climate risk compared to the, the risks of solar geoengineering. Equally, if we were in a, a world which I totally hate, a world where people are very slow to cut emissions and you, you have carbon concentrations going up over 500 parts per million, in that world, same decision about solar geoengineering. It's about the benefits of it compared to the risks. So I think it's less dependent on, on decisions about emissions cuts than, than, than many other people do. Okay. Well, now a lot of uh, the people who registered, they wanted um, to get a sense about the relative um, uh, merits, I guess, of, of different kinds of, of climate change mitigation um, and want to know sort of how solar geoengineering positions with some of those. So maybe we just go quickly through these and you can give me a quick uh, reply on each one. So one of them was uh, agricultural policies such as reduction of tilling or other ways of getting CO2 back into the ground. Any comment on that? How big is it? How effective would it be? I think, I think those are apples and oranges. They just don't do the same thing. So solar geoengineering is a way to reduce the risks, we think, of CO2 that's in the air. Cutting emissions or carbon removal is a way to reduce the amount of CO2 that's in the air. Um, if we could reduce the amount of CO2 that's in the air at no cost, then obviously reducing the amount of CO2 in the air is better than solar geoengineering. So if we could just turn the CO2 in the air knob back to pre-industrial tomorrow, you'd never bother with solar geoengineering. So, so I don't think, 
I don't think I don't I think you're comparing apples and oranges in a way that can't be compared unless unless you think about all the other environmental and social consequences of action. They they just don't do the same thing. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let me see if the rest of these questions that were I asked think the point is you could you, you can the same compare things in a basket. So you can compare you can compare solar power to tidal power. And you can say these are both ways to make low carbon power, but tidal power in many places will have huge environmental impacts. And so solar power is a lot better. That's a sensible comparison because they're both producing low carbon power. Uh -huh. You could compare soil tillage to um, um, uh, putting alkalinity in the ocean as a way to do carbon removal. Uh, and I think we don't know enough to answer that yet. <laughs> um, but, but those are at least apples to apples. But I don't okay, think so not to ask these comparative questions. Um, but here's one: is that can aggressive reforestation be good enough? I mean, to to make good such enough an for what? Well, who's saying what enough is? For well, the person, to, well you enough. even said you would like to get all the way back to before the industrial revolution. But let's just say we stop things where they are right now. Would is it a big enough thing to do that would actually allow us to do that in the presence of? of course, the things that we're already doing today in terms of reducing emissions. Sorry to be obtuse, but I think <laughs> well-posed questions are crucial. So, 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 so could nothing you do, nothing you do about planting trees can get you back to long-term pre-industrial because you actually have to take the carbon back to geological reservoirs. Trees are short-term. Um, I think if the question is how much carbon can you take by planting trees, the peak answer is very big but with very big environmental damage. So I don't think climate's our only environmental problem. I care about the natural ecosystems. Yeah. So if you get very big numbers for planting trees, you're planting trees in all sorts of places where there aren't trees now. And you're doing that with aggressive interventions. Yep. And my view is those are a big environmental footprint that I'd rather avoid. So okay, that's, well, that's, that's, that's that gets answer. me back to apples to apples. So yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's a really great yeah. answer in many respects. But the biggest one that struck me there was that um, the this understanding that you have to look at the at the costs and the benefits and the and you know the implications of every one of these and they're different uh, because of the way in which they operate. So that yeah. being just one of them. I think an important thing to say about nature-based solutions, which of course is an oxymoron at its core, because at the core of the way accounting and IPCC works, what nature does isn't counted for good reasons. And, and, and what people really mean by nature-based solutions are artificially manipulating nature to get more carbon in some place. And that may or may not be a good thing, but, but you need to think hard about whether your goal is just to get more carbon in ecosystems or whether your goal is to have humans have a smaller footprint in ecosystems, be more of ecosystems unmanaged. My hope for the future would be that we have intense industrialization agriculture in some places, and we let more of nature go wild. And going wild means really going wild. It means we're not doing a lot of fire protection. We're not trying to build up big high carbon stocks in places where they're not naturally supposed to be. Okay. So, um, you know, you, and you addressed this earlier on, I want to hit this point again, because this is probably one of the biggest issues involving solar geoengineering, is that there's concern that it's just an easy way out. Um, as you pointed out, it's relatively inexpensive compared to other things you could do. Um, and, um, and, and, and it's a much, much simpler uh, solution than the very hard work, for instance, of reducing emissions. Um, so, and here's a couple of statements that were made. I think it's really good. I've been leery of geoengineering because it seems like a free pass to emit more greenhouse gases, much as higher agricultural yields have enabled population to grow unchecked. How can we ensure this will not be the case? And another one, there's the possibility that we can geoengineer our way out of the problem, reduce the urgency of dealing with climate change through mitigation of greenhouse gases. Does Great. it give an excuse to polluters to keep doing what they've always been doing? Great, great questions. This is the core of it. Let me give you a couple different answers. So um, first of all, the comment that high agricultural yields allowed populations to get bigger. Maybe. There's a lot of ways to tell that story. It's very interesting to think about what the alternative world would have been where we didn't do Haber-Bosch. We never, Haber, Haber and Bosch never invented the Haber-Bosch process for nitrogen, humans' biggest direct intervention in geochemical cycles. 
course, they invented it partly not for fertilizer, but for weapons. Um, what if we'd never done that? I think that population would have gone up pretty hard for other reasons, uh, better sanitation uh, and industrialization anyway. And I think what would have happened is we would have taken more land from nature. We would have all eaten less meat. It would have taken more land from nature. And maybe population would have been a little smaller, but basically we would have just worked harder to get the food out of more land with more net environmental impact. This is one of these hard to answer questions. Like it's like, you know, thinking about why whaling went down and what part of it was to do with finding oil. So, so technological substitution is tough to, to pick apart the back end. Maybe a more proximate one is this question of when you have a, a uh, something that, that reduces risks, to what extent do you get risk compensation where people just take on more risks? We all know that happens personally. And to be clear, there's nothing unethical or wrong about it. So you, know, you mentioned climbing. I'm willing to do climbs like that because, you know, just to take an example, modern ice screws and modern dynamic nylon ropes are just ridiculously good compared to what we had in the 50s. And so you can go on grade five ice climbs and realistically expect you don't fall on ice climbs, but if you did, you're going to be just a little banged up. That's a technological fix. I would not do that ice climb on hemp ropes with older equipment be too risky. So I've risk compensated. So the point is the risk reduction that came from those new ropes, I didn't get all that risk compensation because now I'm doing more dangerous climbs. But overall, climbing still got safer. Now that's an obscure example of climbing. Let's take cars. Car fatalities per lane mile in the US are down by roughly a factor of five since I was a kid. Lots of factors did that. One of the factors was a kind of pure technical fixes to do with airbags and, and trouble zones. And people said, on the record, I'm not, this is not random, serious people said we should not have airbags and some of those other things because they will just encourage people to drive more dangerously. I think, first of all, that's just outright unethical. It's like saying that we shouldn't give people potential life-saving things because we know better. That's a very dangerous ethical question. That's who the we is. But also, it's not clear when you think about what happened, what happened in the end was a lot of different factors that were both technical and behavioral. So to get that factor of five, we have better roadways, pure technical fixes in car design, but a lot of social and behavioral changes. So I'm 57. I and my friends were a lot more casual about driving with alcohol uh, uh, when I was a kid than most kids are now. Uh, and we have graduated licenses. We have a big range of things, and they've been synergistic. The sense that that, that we really were reducing automotive fatalities made the whole policy of reducing automotive fatalities more credible and made us do even more. So don't be too confident which way the feedbacks go. So yes, there is no question of worry that solar geoengineering might encourage some people to say, let's just keep the fossil fuel party going. But equally, they could contribute to an overall sense that we really were solving the climate problem, which built political energy to do more to solve the climate problem. So it's, it's very hard to pick apart uh, 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 the way that answer goes. And then be a third version of that question. I think this is really about political tipping points at the middle. If you think about a spectrum of political action on climate, you have the kind of viral progressive left, which I consider myself, I'm on, who really want to see climate action. And we're going to want to see climate action, even with geoengineering. And then you have the hard fossil right, let's say, which doesn't want to see climate action. And they're going to want to see, not want to see climate action, whether or not there's geoengineering. The presence of geoengineering won't change those, the, the views on the extremes. What it might do, and that's the worry, is change the median voters' kind of judgment. That if it's reduced the climate risk a little bit, it may make some people in the middle say, ah, oh, we don't need to worry about climate so much. We don't know. It's certainly a legitimate worry. There is empirical evidence from asking individual people in clever experiments that actually knowing more about solar geoengineering makes people more incented to worry about climate change and want to cut emissions. But I don't think that necessarily means that's the outcome. Bottom line is it's a legitimate question, but the big decision right now is about research. And we need to be very cautious, I believe, about being so confident we know about that people will act wrongly, that we, the kind of elite who we're gonna decide supposedly, are gonna withhold a potentially life-saving technology. Yep. Okay. Um, 
bunch of unrelated questions here that I want to give you pretty quickly. So, so you mentioned SRM, which I believe means solar radiation management. Is that right? Yeah. Or solar, radi another... solar radiation modification is now what the IPCC standard term Modification, terminal. okay. So the question here is that um, if this happens, uh, maybe like 10 years from now or so, so, what are the funding options that you see for something like this? For funding deployment or research? Well, let's do research first and then and then maybe talk about deployment. So I think the near-term issue is research. So right now we've tried to do estimates of the total amount of research for solar geoengineering worldwide, and including not just research, but, but discussion about policy. And it's of order 10 or 15 million a year globally. There have been about a thousand papers published. Um, to give you a sense of scale, total research in atmospheric and climate science overall is of order 10 billion. That's counting satellites and everything. Um, and the total amount of money we're spending cutting emissions right now is about 300 billion a year. That's Bloomberg energy finance number for, for clean tech deployment. So I think that you could really argue that it's worth spending something of order five to 10% of the total that we spend on the climate science world. So something of order 100 mil a year class globally on the solar general research program and that you make very fast progress because you're not inventing a new technology. You're basically adapting uh, scientific knowledge we know about aerosols and climate models and atmospheric chemistry and, and uh, aerospace technologies we mostly have. You're, you're adapting those technologies to a new purpose. I think you could learn very fast. I think the key of a good research program is to avoid groupthink. I think the key to that is to have it be dispersed and have some groups trying to articulate how this actually works in the public interest to reduce risks for the most with the least chance of, of misuse and having many more groups thinking of all the ways they could fail in a way that's independent. So, so I, I think there's a very strong case for that kind of research. And I'm spending a lot of my effort right now trying to really advance the cause of a much broader international open research program. I mean, some of us are thinking about whether there should be some kind of freestanding foundation to help drive this forward. That's to me the issue about research. Real deployment, my guess is this will be a small number of governments that fundamentally make decision together. The actual cost of deployment, at least of some of these technologies, the one that I've spent most time on, most people have spent most time on, stratospheric aerosols, uh, the actual direct cost of deployment are low enough that if governments are doing it, it's not a big deal. The issue is really all about who makes a decision and what conflicts there are. Yeah. So, so <laughs> just a small technical issue in a way, do you see any uh, concern about uh, acid rain kind of like things coming from sulfate in the stratosphere? No, that's simple. Uh, uh, a simple stoichiometry, there's a, two papers published, no big doubts. Remember I said there's 50 million tons of sulfur we're putting in the lower atmosphere, that's the stuff that causes acid rain. And we're talking about one and a half million tons for, for solar geo. Uh, it's just mole for mole. Um, all the sulfur you put in the atmosphere is gonna come down to the surface eventually. Uh, um, uh, but actually it's, it's worse than that because the, the sulfur from industrial pollution is concentrated. So acid rain is, it, it was, and it's not so bad anymore, in concentrated places where sulfur emissions were high. So that global one and a half million a year is, people have done the calculations. The acid, it's one of the, the few things we know clearly, the acid rain impact would be nil. All right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask one more question and then and I'm gonna try to read some of these Q and A's here uh, to, to feather them into the conversation. Um, but, um, you know, the biggest thing here, and, it, and it's been a problem with climate change for decades, honestly, is being able to communicate what it is, what, what's the problem, how can it be solved, and, and so on, to the average voter so that they comprehend it and they can help drive policy through the political process. In your mind, what are the best ways to imagine and communicate um, the, about solar geoengineering uh, to to into the, the, the polity, if you will. I'm gonna dodge that. I actually realized I did want to come back and show two slides on risk because the last sort of addressing the last question on risk. Will you let me do that for a sec? Sure. So 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 because we've sort of been talking around it. So there's a huge set of risks. This is a kind of a like a random grab bag of risk, deliberately messy. Uh, uh, I assume you can see these slides. And then this is organizing them in a particular way. And and this is the way I now characterize the risks. So, so the one set of things are the physical risks, not political risks, but the physical risks of, I think why is the wrong word? I, I now I'm using the word benevolent. So benevolent doesn't mean omniscient. It doesn't, it, benevolent includes mistakes, includes the errors. So I have a more complicated version of this thing with a table where I, where I talk about errors. But to me, 
if human society uses this with good intention, which will include all the normal errors that happen from high risk technologies like this, then there's a whole set of, of, of potential physical risks of wide, wide use. And this is not all of them, this is just some. Then there's separately the risk of malevolent geoengineering. So this is the risk of benevolent. Then there's the risk of malevolent geoengineering, people deliberately using it in a way to make themselves much better off compared to others or deliberately using it to, to harm others. Then there's a set of risks that, that we call moral hazard or mitigation inhibition that are basically this political risk that doing this will, will cause us to emit more CO2 and build up the total risk. And then there's risks associated with just the fact that, that somehow we're moving into a different world in our relationship with nature. And to me, those are the kind of four high level categories of, of what the risks are. And I think um, uh, you'll see that one risk that's not there explicitly that I think is, 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 is it actually comes in two different categories is what people often call the termination risk. The fact that once you've done it for a while, there's a, a bad consequence if you stop something. But to me, that's not a, a high level category. It actually fits in two places. So one place it fits is under the uh, physical risk of benevolent geoengineering where if for some reason the system fails and we can talk about scenarios for how that happens uh, and then you have sudden warming. And then the other issue is under malevolent, where if uh, uh, some party wants it to fail, deliberately makes it fail. So it gives you some sense of, of how I think about the categorization of these risks. Now I'm happy to go back to the question. Yeah, the question you had was about the right way to communicate the public. I think that the answer is, I wish I know. I, I think that I've learned something about communicating to some of the leaders in the environmental movement, uh, though I've made lots of mistakes. And I think the key is to be really clear about what the risks are and be transparent about what we know and we don't know. Um, and to make clear that uh, there really is, I think, a, an environmental case. It's an interesting writer recently who's, who's, who's characterized the fact that there's a set of things we do that are, that are um, anthropogenic, that is done by people, but not necessarily anthropocentric. So why would we do solar geoengineering? One answer, obviously, is to protect ourselves, protect humanity against, uh, say, high heat. But the other answer is to protect the natural world. And in that sense, uh, uh, we're actually doing something that's in nature's interests, uh, uh, um, because you can protect the world in ways you cannot do by emissions cuts alone. Uh, uh, but it's something humans are doing that's, that's anthropogenic, that's controlling the world. So here's a good one, I think. Um, the question is basically, so let's say, you start, you do what you said, you start the process of solar geoengineering, you're, you're on a slow ramp and everything, and along the way, you discover, uh-oh, there's an unintended consequence that's much bigger than we thought, we need to pull back. How long, I mean, how quickly could you do that? How long would it take to do something like so, that? So there's a whole bunch of interesting scenarios here. So, so, so first of all, it depends on the kind of geoengineering. So, um, uh, marine cloud brightening or cirrus thinning both have inherent time scales that are of order a day. So if you stop the input, the, uh, the, the stops right away. In some ways, I think that makes the termination risk more acute because it means that if you're doing two watts per square meter, if something goes wrong in the software or whatever, the system stops essentially instantly. And also because you can turn parts of it off malevolently, you can perhaps do some kinds of weather control for, uh, and the same is true of space-based actually. If you put a system at L1, it's inherently unstable. So in principle, a malevolent action or one software error can turn it off instantly. For stratospheric aerosols, you've got a kind of inherent time scale of a year and a half. So it means you, that's both good or bad. It means if there's a little glitch for a month, no big deal, the system keeps going. It also means if you want to turn off instantly, you can't, you've got to wait for this kind of year and a half. Um, I think in practice, you would ramp it up slowly watching for problems. There's a set of problems that are the real unknowns, unknowns, atmospheric chemistry, I think you could detect uh, uh, plausibly as you ramped up. If there was some unknown unknown that you only did detect when it was done at say two watts per square meter, then you face a trade-off between how quickly you ramp down, which would be a balancing of the risks of ramping down against the risks of whatever was this new thing you'd found. And probably that doesn't mean you turn off instantly, probably it means some balancing. Or, you start some other kind of geoengineering. You ramp it down a little bit and you start doing marine cloud brightening or build a space shield or what have you. So I think that there's a series of complicated trade-offs that depend on the why. Sometimes people pose this problem as, suppose it just shuts off. And I think that is not that useful. You really have to think about what the causes and effects are. And um, 
uh, sometimes people say, suppose we just decide to turn off. Well, if we decide to turn off, we can't say that's a bad thing. <laughs> um, I think the issue is if it's, it's political instability turns it off. And um, I think the issue there is that it is to realize that probably we have the opposite problem. That with a technology like this, where once you're doing it, there is profound self-interest in each country in keeping it going, that it's actually probably very hard to turn it off. Because even if, if in the initial negotiations, say you were a country that opposed solar geoengineering, you did never wanted it on, you thought it was a bad idea. Once it's happening, it's in your self-interest to maintain the ability to do it in case I stop, even if you initially opposed it because of the risk. And, and what that means is effectively you need near unanimity among the big countries to turn it off. And there's a really beautiful analogy that Oliver Morton, I think, thought of, which is that to GPS. So as some of you may know, we the US was the original GPS system, but the Russians have built one, GLONASS, and the Europeans are building one, Galileo, and the Chinese have one, I'm afraid I forget its name, I'm sorry. And so we now have really four of these, and some people, like I have a watch that detects several of them. Um, why are the Europeans building that thing? It, in a way, it's crazy. They gave the free service of the Russian and American one. Why spend billions of dollars when you got something for free? It's not any better meaningfully. The reason is they don't like the idea, fundamentally, that the Americans can turn it off. They want the power to turn it off. And, and what we now have effectively is that the overall thing that is GPS, not just the American one, but the, 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 the you know, if you have a multi, multi band receiver, essentially you need all four parties the Chinese, the Russians, the Europeans, the Americans to all agree to turn it off before it's really off. And, and, and that each of them kind of wants a veto over turning it off effectively. And I think you get exactly the same dynamics with solar geo. So yeah, speaking of that, so turning it on, you're gonna to have to get the literally global support, right? Uh, to do something like this. So, so, you... so let, me just, let me just interrupt you right there. In what world? So, so are you talking about the world you'd like to live in? or the world we live in. In the world we live in, I'm not advocating this, the answer is just clear, that's not true. Did we get global buy-in before Facebook was created? I don't think so. We do all sorts of things that are technologies that have global implications without global buy-in. I like a world where there was better governance, and I don't think unanimity is the right answer, but I think more global buy-in. But if you're, it's an empirical statement of the way the world is, the answer is no. So, but you're not suggesting, are you, that, that one country implements something like this without having broader support? Are you asking me what I think should happen or what could happen? I mean, it's well, just probably, a fact. I mean, so, so, so yeah, I mean. What would happen because I guess the more. What would happen is yes, some powerful countries could in principle side do it. I think if you imagine yourself, I think in practice, they wouldn't, and here's why. Uh, the world is interconnected in complicated ways with trade treaties and other disputes. No political decision ha internationally happens in a vacuum. Any international negotiation, I mentioned my parents, my stepmother at one point was head of Aquaculture Canada and she was negotiating in a fisheries dispute with Australia. And inevitably this gets coupled with other disputes at the World uh, Trade Organization, right? So if you're a country that wants to do this, you've decided it's really in the interest of your citizens. Maybe it's your China or India or the US, whatever. Um, if you decide you really want to do it, you know there's going to be opposition and pushback, uh, especially if countries feel like you're going, they're, you're going, your, your country's going over their heads. So even if you're fundamentally self-interested, you're going to go and use all the political, many of the political levers you have to try and bring some other allies online because you know it'll be more politically stable if you don't do it unilaterally. So even if you fundamentally want to do it unilaterally, you're likely to go seek a coalition, not unanimous, but seek a coalition of other countries because you know that if you do it with a bunch of other countries, it's more likely to be stable afterwards. That's just rational self-interest. Well, do you see like the United Nations being a body where you could take this issue to and, and work on it? Well, it's already happened. Um, one of the things we haven't talked about is the way that governance discussions have begun. So one of the more exciting things in this whole field is a guy called uh, Janos Pastor, who was formerly the chief advisor to Ban Ki-moon for climate, the single person most in the middle of the UN climate process. He uh, now running an NGO with some terrific staff that tries to, doesn't take a position on whether it's good or bad, just take a position that we ought to have global governance conversations about this. 
as part of that process that they contributed to starting, there actually was, pre-COVID, a discussion that came up to the beginning of a conversation with the Security Council uh, uh, a year ago, roughly right now, a year ago in a month. Um, not that it was a high level discussion, but the beginning of the back channel discussions were happening. So some of these things are happening and, yeah. and we need more of them. There's been discussion at the UNEA, the United Nations Environment Assembly. So yes, for sure, UN organizations are part of the way that nations interact. I also think it's very tempting and you read some scientific, some technical papers um, about international relations on, on this topic. And you'd imagine the world is, I forget how many countries there are, 210 or whatever is the right number nowadays, 210 billiard balls bouncing together. Like the countries are hard sphere objects, the countries are, are entities and they're each, they're integral. Um, that's not the way the world works anymore. Power has in some sense for many things diffused away from nation states, not totally, but it has. And international organizations are very important both international businesses, international civil society organizations. I mean, the big international environmental groups play a central role in helping to shape climate policy. And they'll probably, and I think they should, play a central role in shaping what happens about solar geoengineering. So it isn't just countries, it's, it's, it's what happens inside countries and between them. Okay, well, with that, we're past the half hour. And um, I think uh, we're gonna have to end the Q&A, but David, I wanna say thank you very, very much um, this has really been interesting and entertaining. Um, and so here is our official thank you in green. Uh, and then uh, we're going to very quickly uh, talk about our next event, uh, which is coming up uh, near the end of March. Lynn Jurek, who is the co-founder and CEO of Sunrun, is going to be honored by the MIT Club of Northern California as a pioneer of clean energy. And, um, and then she'll be uh, speaking in the same time frame. Uh, between 5 and 6.30 Pacific time uh, with uh, uh, a great moderator, uh, actually Barry Cinnamon, who's moderated several panels for us in the past. So I hope many of you who are interested in just energy in general, clean energy in particular, come and hear about what Lynn has done. Uh, and for those entrepreneurs out there, uh, a lot of what she's going to talk about is what's it like to start an energy company, build it up, you know, and to scale it to, to where at this point in time now, Sunrun is the largest uh, solar company in the United States. So should be very good. Can, can I offer a last few, last comment to the audience? You, you certainly may. You got the floor again. Thank you very much. Just to say thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And, and this is a tough topic. Uh, I'm really interested to hear, hear real criticism. If you think stuff I said was wrong or you think that there's ways in which really I, I or others should be thinking about it different or you have questions, feel free to reach out. And um, I and some others are really thinking hard about how to expand the research uh, in, in this uh, across the world. Uh, and we would love help, help thinking about the, the ways to do that that are most um, ethical, that are uh, most open and transparent, thinking about the right way to fund those things and how to structure research programs. So I'm really interested to get, get input from an audience like this. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. Let's all give... A big hand to David. David, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for organizing. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.